This is the final broadcast that will ever be made from the GSL studio here in Mokdong. And in fact, it is my last week's Liberty Cast, as well as Caldors going into group number E of the Up and Downs. This is yep. a very special day, I feel. It's a little bit sad. The last time Swings of Liberty and the last time that we have a cast in the studio here in Mukdong. I mean, it's also a new start. It's Heart of the Swamp, and it's also the new studio that we have in Gangnam starting in uh, yeah, late March. So a lot of things will change in the future, but this is... I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic right now. Yeah, you know, things began here for me, and it's not the end at all, but it feels like this place is always going to be something that only myself and the fans out there will remember. GSL is a very big and popular term, it always will be, but people are looking at this, and like the background that's behind us, it's the last time you're going to see this. Like, it's never going to be here again. Yeah, it's going to be very different from now on. I can still remember when I came to Korea, and the first thing that actually happened was that I was watching, I think it was back then, MMA, winning one of the finals. It was in uh, one of the Blizzard tournaments, and we were just watching on the monitor outside. It wasn't transmitted in the studio in here. That was pretty special. It was actually good fun. We're still, I feel like this was like the end of summer in Korea in 2011, long time ago. But this is the last time that we have the studio in Mukdong, so our last cast. And it's also the last up and down group. Yeah, the last group, group number E, I, or group number five. It's group it's letter E. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we had a little bit of a change, you might have read that already. Uh, apparently we have only five players today. Originally we had six players in this group, but there has been an adjustment. Yeah, Rain has been seeded into Code S directly, so therefore will not be playing as part of yep. this group. Which is kind of a change for our group because he was one of the favorites to get out, I think. So this gives exactly. the other players in the group a lot better of a chance. Exactly, and a lot of people have been speculating a little bit about the wildcard group. And to this point we don't really know if there is going to be a wildcard group. One of the main reasons is that starting tomorrow, the studio will move. Yes. We're going to talk a little bit about this later, but let's have a quick look first at the yesterday's results. This was Group C, the earlier group, where we had two Terran players advance with Fantasy and, of course, Maru. Yep, Nesti and Keen not quite able to make it out, but Keen would take that third place spot, so keep that in mind. Yep, Hero having a bad day, not winning a single match. Yeah. And then later in our six-player group, where we had two ties, was a bit of a sad story because Noblesse, the one who went 4-0 in the group at first, did not get out. He is third place. If there's going to be a wildcard group, he will get another shot. But the two players that advanced yesterday were two Zergs. It was boom boom and crazy. Noblesse will take the third place spot though. Yep. And if we have that wildcard group, we'll talk a little bit about that later. He will be the one getting the spot. Alive was the one in yesterday's group who had the most trouble going 0-4. Epic final match, but still not able to take a single set. It was a pretty crazy group with the two tiebreakers that we had. It also dragged on for a long time, which definitely played a role in the last few matches. You could see how stressed out those players in the tiebreaker were. Boom boom crazy and Noblesse. And then the second tiebreaker, the Terran player, then was not strong enough anymore to take down those games. And here are today's matches. We have an excellent five players. We used to have six. One getting the spot already, but we still have Sniper, Flying, Byung, Su, and Byun. And this changes things up a little bit now that Rain is not in the group anymore, now that he got his direct seat into Codes. I actually think there's a pretty good chance that we will have two Zerg players advance today. Sniper and Su are just looking so strong these days, and I feel a little bit for the Terrans here. I would give Flying a chance if he plays on the same level that he showed us when he was facing Stefano. Can he do it again today though? He's up against the champion first, up against Sniper, still the current GSL champion. Yeah, the most recent until Saturday when everything will change. Sniper definitely going to be the second favorite Gallus group. I'd even put him more favorite than Rain was. Flying is the only Pros representative, meaning that Sniper probably practiced a little bit for Pros, but Rain was seated only today, so. Now he's probably going to have a little bit more flexibility going to the Zerg versus Protoss. Flying definitely not happy about the map that he has to play against the Zerg player here. Neoplanet S has been proven a very tough terrain for Protoss in this matchup. Sniper, of course, probably very happy when he saw the map. And now we are heading into our first game today. This is the last cast that we will ever have in Muktong. This is the last cast that Wolf and I will have in Wings of Liberty. And we are starting things off with our first game at the Up and Down Group D at the GSL. Sniper versus Flying. Starting to the bottom left of Neo Planet S, we have the champion, Zerg player for Team MVP. He is, of course, MVP Sniper. Sniper, GSL champion, 
up against the player to the top right, the only pros in the group from Wung Jin Stars. He is Wung Jin Stars Fly. And Flying is a good Pros player. He made it to the up and downs, but I would not put him as one of the favorites to get out of the group. It's going to be a really tough one for him. He had a few, well, he had appearances in the Pro League. He also had a few appearances in the GSL so far. But what we really don't know is exactly how good he is, how stable his play is. He's a player that has played a little bit gimmicky in the past. He's very aggressive. He likes to just try to surprise his opponent. We saw him with the tease against Stefano in game number one on Daybreak, where he was successful. But then later on on Belgia Vestage, he showed that he's also a very strong player going into a late game scenario. So definitely one of the wild cards in this group, I would say. It's not really someone that you can easily judge. Yeah, his builders are very good. He has, if he has a plan, you have to be careful. Uh, he likes to get the builds, builds well. He's going for a Nexus first before Forge. We have, of course, the pool first here for Sniper, no surprise here. And talking a little bit about flying and his, yeah, his run in Code A, he faced Arthur in his first match. With a 2-1, he defeated the opposing Protoss player. And then he got, went on to de uh, defeat Stefano. In the second round against Stefano, he was quite successful with the 2-1. He took him out. But he had to face another Casper player in the third round of Code A against SOS. He was just barely not able to defeat him. Therefore, he finds himself in the up and downs here against one of the strongest Zerg players that we have in the GSL. Sniper is a champion. He won the last championship. He's strong, especially against Protoss. He has a 63% win ratio with, in total, uh, 70 games played against uh, his opponent's race. And if you just go down his Code A history in this season, he was able to take down Maru with a 2-0, and then he lost to Hyun in a ZVZ. It was a little bit like the rematch of the final of the last GSL season that we had in 2012. This time, Hyun was the winner. Hyun probably would have traded that any time. I'm sure he would. Well, I have to say, uh, if Sniper loses this match, it would be perhaps the biggest upset of the entire group. He's just on uh, the next level. The thing is just like this map in works so well for him. For a Protoss player, taking a third base on Neo Planet S is very tricky. You have such a huge distance to cover between the third and your own natural that it's very easy for the Zerg player to attack your two fronts. You can always send a few links over to the third base, can attack then at the natural, and it's very, very difficult to just hold the line as a Protoss player. It's very, very tricky. So Sniper will probably just try to uh, capitalize on this, and for flying, it's definitely going to be a, a very tough match. Yeah, not going to be easy. Well, Sniper is going to struggle a little bit to scout whether or not the Cybernex core is being used in any way, whether it's being Chronobus or not, because the core is all the way at the back of Flying Space. So this is something he's chosen because of the way the wall works on this map. You don't have enough space to put all of your buildings there. He could have made it as most pro players do behind the pylon that's at the wall, but he decided to make it in his main. So this is a little bit harder for Sniper to scout. It's not only the scouting, it's very safe now. One of the problems that you have as a Protoss, if you take this third base, is these multi-prong attacks that I mentioned earlier. And what a Zerg player will do as a result is always attack your wall. While you're trying to, as a Protoss, trying to defend your third, the Zerg is trying to attack your wall at the natural. And if then suddenly the core is part of your wall, this is one of the first targets that every Zerg will aim for. Because then suddenly you can't get sentries anymore, you can't get stalkers. So having the core in the main base gives flying also a bit of safety going into the middle game. We see the Robo go down here before plus one, yep. and he has been scouted by the Overlord. He doesn't. He didn't see the Overlord, but the Overlord saw the course. He doesn't know he's been scouted. And I feel that on this map, trying to use the Robo to expand is going to be very difficult, but he has not started plus one, so it doesn't look like he's going to be going for that push. I would have actually liked him to go into uh, an Immortal push. It's a little bit weird to say that, now we have plus one started, because Sniper was the first Zerg player to really defeat Parting's Immortal Push, and Parting is the player who really coined this two-base timing attack. What Sniper definitely knows is that there is a very big possibility, a huge possibility of flying going into a two-base timing, just because it's so hard to get a third base here. And now with the War Prison being built and also the attack upgrade started, it looks like flying wants to put on some gateway pressure yeah. first. He's going to put some gateway pressure on. He has different ways he can do this. He could just use the War Prism to fly units over to the third base, try to harass, maybe trap some drones. Could go into the main and try to force field out. But there are overlords in position in almost every way. The only place he doesn't have overlords in position is to the north, but he already sees the war prison now. Yeah. 
He saw the war prison, he gives the high ground vision now, and he even yeah, picks the units up and drops them on the other side of this cliff, so just that he can take down the Overlord. I don't so, know about that Guardian well Shield. That was a bit weird. Yeah, the Guardian Shield was probably not all that useful. The last time that I've seen an Overlord attacking a sentry, it has been a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the Overlord could attack, it probably wouldn't even use ranged attacks. It is going to be a weird version of the Immortal push, starting out with a sentry attack. As he is getting the Immortals now adding six gateways. This is going to throw Sniper off a little bit. This is actually how the Immortal push on the Metalopolis first emerged. You had the players trying to do some pressure with the War Prison and then building up the Immortal count back at home, trying to occupy the Zerg, putting pressure onto the economy and move in with those Immortals later on. So this is very, very old school what Flying is currently doing. And the Overlords don't see the extra gates, so he is starting Roaches now, but he doesn't know just yet what's coming. He's got up to 62 drones. This is still holdable by any means, but he cannot do anything re going forward here. Yeah, timing is very important. We are at the 9 minute mark and a lot of Protos will move out at 9.30 with their Immortals. Speed is not done just yet, but now Roaches are being produced. We have the completed layer check for Sniper. He's already adding his uh, speed for the Roaches. And we have him with a decent creep spread here. At the third, he could spread it a little bit better right now. He still has creep tumors that are active. Doesn't do it just yet, but he's already preparing for a two base attack. The weird thing for Sniper is that he wants to put pressure on with his Roaches now at a possible third. But the War Prism is on the other side of the map, so... Uh, this is weird, because he's going to try to catch these Immortal Forces, he misses them. But Flying also doesn't have a lot to defend. Whoever attacks first might get a little bit of an advantage here. The big problem for Sniper is that it's going to be difficult for him to break through this wall with the second cannon just about to finish. But he's going to try anyways. Here comes the warping of the sentries for the force field. The forge is nearly down. He needs the force field right now. And there it is. Just blocking it, but he needs the second one. Yeah, he needs the second one. He has it. It looks like he's going to wait until the last second. The pylon falls. And he's busy he microing over here at the same time. He's microing at the bottom left now, trying to take down this third base. The Roaches to the top right won't be able to take down the wall. They're just too many units for flying. This is one round of warp ins that the Protoss player now doesn't have at the bottom left. But he doesn't need it to take down the third. Really well done so far by flying. Yeah, he defends at the natural, losing the forge only. And this is still a formidable force. More roaches coming out, he's going to have plus one, but he doesn't have an infestation pit. And so many of these sentries still at nearly full energy, so he has a lot more force fields available. And the gateway production is still there, the warp prism remains. Sniper it needs to now defend. He can't hold his third, but maybe if he can crush this force, he has a chance. He comes in with a flank, the force fields though are too good. So far, so good for flying. He takes on the third, but he hasn't won this game by any means just yet. He needs to do more damage than this, especially since Fly uh, sorry, Sniper pulled most of his drones already back. He he didn't lose a lot of harvesters here. Only, he didn't actually lose a single one. Right now we have Flying coming in once again. The Force Fields are good, shutting out most of those Roaches, but can he take them down? Yeah, he loses an Immortal here on the right side, but the Force Fields are so good that he just cannot connect with any of his Roaches. The Zealots, though, are falling slowly but steadily here, and now that he doesn't have much of a buffer, the Sentries are exposed. There's just too much DPS, too much production, and Sniper does not have the Larva to continue bringing Roaches out here to get the surround. Flying currently has 14 sentries, most of them out of energy. Can Sniper turn this around? Flying tries to go for this two base timing. He knows getting a third base on this map is nearly impossible. The Roach Warren is exposed. He takes it down. No more Roaches for Sniper. He's limited to Zerglings now, and he is so short on Lava. Yeah, he's down in supply here as well. Flying just has way too much production. The Warp Prism is still active here. Warps in four more Stalkers, and I think that's going to be the nail in the coffin. Flying is actually going to take Sniper out here with a tricky build order, just like we saw him use against Stefano. He knows these build orders, he knows how to be sneaky. Blocking the ramp now with a force field. The drones are forced to be pulled off the mineral line, trying to trying to attack. He's dancing his units, he knows he has one, and that is GG. That was a pretty surprising result, but you know, it was, it was a build order that Sniper did not scout. He saw the Robo and he saw the War Prism. Which led him to believe something else. He didn't think it was going to be a delayed immortal push. Sniper should have known that something like this is very likely. The thing is, on a map like this, what do you do as a Protoss? Do you really take your third base? Sniper is such a strong opponent that taking the third is always a huge risk, especially on Neo Planet, as for the reasons mentioned. And flying, he knows it. Exactly for this reason, he went into a two base timing. And Sniper, usually a specialist, is holding those off. Went into a lot of drones at 62. 
the run by did not really work when he was trying to go in. There were already two sentries in place. Then he loses his uh, yeah third base. Suddenly doesn't have the production of the third yeah. anymore. No lava available, and in the end he loses because of the force fields, which is really good for. Flying. If he had known this was a push like that, he wouldn't have sent those forces to the base because maybe you can get through. But if you have that many gateways, then obviously you're gonna have warpins to get some sentries at home. And sniper, I think, just maybe misread the build. But flying takes another Protoss versus Zerg victory where. You know, he's not the strongest in this matchup, but he seems to have good build orders. He just prepares very well for his opponents. I personally was a bit surprised that Sniper didn't start to cut his drones a bit earlier and prepared for a push like this. Well, right now, we're going into our second game, though. Here we have Pyong. He is up against Sue. Sue has shown us great matches in Code A so far. He looked strong in every single one of his games. And Pyong was struggling quite a lot against Zerg just recently. So this is going to be a very interesting game that sets the pace for this group. Yep, this is going to be quite unique. Uh, two castle players battling out against each other. The map is Icarus, so usually a map where Terran excels if they can deal with the Zerg's early aggression. The I've seen players try to mech on this map as well. Yep. It's a big if though, it's really a map where we see a lot of aggression, especially by Zerg players. We've seen Nidus attacks, Roach attacks are very common here. Might be something that Sue is currently considering against Byung. The match has started, we are jumping into the game. This is the second set, we are here at the GSL Up and Downs Group D with Kalon Wolf.